Hello and welcome to another episode of Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug and I'm speaking tonight from our uh, campus on the southeastern corner of Louisville, Kentucky, the outskirts, where we have this observatory uh, with a Rasa 11-inch telescope that's out there ready to roll. Uh, I guess the night is not looking too badly, but can you see those wispy clouds? They keep sneaking in and out of views, kind of spoiling things. But, you know, we weren't expecting them till 10 o'clock. We'll do the best we can, right? We'll try to get by as best we can. This is a live view of the scope over there. And in fact, right now, we have it pointed at the open cluster NGC 1342, which is D... Uh, in Stephen James O'Meara's book, uh, his book is called The Secret Deep. It's a list of 109 objects that he felt like were kind of overlooked, and so he called it The Secret Deep. And we're glad that you're with us tonight. This is kind of an impromptu session. We saw a couple of hours ago that there might be a window of clear sky tonight from 8.30 to 10 Eastern time, so we're going to try it. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to see if I can find you over here so that I can see what you're seeing. I just want to check the audio and make sure our audio is good. Yeah, and it is. So welcome and we're glad you're here. So let's get started. We're going to go ahead and put this name in at the top of our screen. It's NGC 1342. And then at the bottom of our screen, uh, this little title that's here, we're going to go ahead and call this SD11, that's Secret Deep 11, and then we put in parentheses the um, NGC number 1342, the, what does that stand for? New Galactic Catalog, I think, and it's kind of old now, 100 years old, um, an open cluster in the constellation Perseus, I think it is, Perseus. So, um, it's super to have you. Uh, let's go to the screen and you'll be able to see the cluster right here in the middle. I would say this cluster is kind of loosely packed. And uh, here's a nice yellow star. Um, but otherwise, I would say it's not really the kind of cluster that would have attracted us. Let's see what uh, Stephen James O'Meara says about it. Secret Deep 11. It's really easy in this book to find these objects because Stephen James O'Meara, when he published this with the help of Cambridge Press, these the object numbers are here in this big black band across the top. So it's really quick and easy. Secret Deep 11. He says it's called the, the Stingray Cluster. Would you have guessed that? Does that look like a stingray to you? Otherwise known as C. Robin. Let's let you look at this and see if you can make out a stingray or a C. Robin. Excuse me, a C. Robin. This was first observed by William Herschel in December of 1799. Can you believe this guy that discovered all these? He also said, coarsely scattered, about 15 arc minutes wide. It's, um, I guess... Oh, there was a comet that passed through this cluster. A lot of people were introduced to it through that comet. Oh, we've got Stu with us. Glad to have you here, Stu. Uh, good to have you on. And Mike, glad, to, glad you're there from Georgia. Simon, good to have you. Let's see. Stu, you are in, if I remember right, let me see if I can get these cities correct. Stu, you're in Sydney, Australia. And Simon, I think you're in, is it Perth? I'm so sorry if I'm insulting you. Uh, new general catalog. That's right. Thank you, Stu. And uh, Stu's uh, greeting everybody there. Anyway, this cluster is about 1,700 light years away. And uh, I guess it has a magnitude of 6.7 if you compare it as, a, as an entire cluster, Perth. Yes, Simon, thanks. Um, he gives a little bit of the history and how to find it. He says it's below naked eye, so you do need a telescope. And he says he can just barely see a sea robin swimming south. Trying to see the sea robin. 
a sea robin swimming south. This guy has an imagination. Its wing-like fins extend to the east and west from the southern part of the cluster. Okay, I guess, I guess I see those wings. See, here would be one wing right here, and here would be another wing, I guess. Uh, its tail reaches the north where it ends up a pretty double star. And there's that double star. Let me see if we can zoom in on that and see if you can see the double star. There's that double star. Well, that's kind of nice, isn't it? All right, we'll just catch a quick snapshot of this. You notice that we're not, um, we're not really live stacking this because it's basically an open cluster. In our, um, in our little um, observation here, we'll say something like um, 1,700 light years distant, Omira saw the shape of a, what did he call it? A um, sea robin. Sea robin? Never even heard of that. Coarse, scattered. Honestly, you got to wonder. But it is nice. It's a nice little gathering of stars, isn't it? Well, so that's, uh, that's, that's the end of that. What else are you guys saying about this? Hello from St. Cecile in New Brunswick. David, good to have you on board. Tuaranga. Why do I keep forgetting that, Stu? I should know this. Simon says Perth, yes. Okay, good to have all of you guys aboard. Thanks for being here. Larry Fraley in Arizona, welcome. Glad you're aboard, Larry. Well, let's go to our next object here. This is going to be, um, we're, we're sorting in order. Let me, let me do a refresh of this. Um, now we'll sort in order of best. And uh, boy, we have a nice open cluster here, NGC 1245. Let's go to that one next. NGC 1245. And this is SD9. Okay, so I'm going to start our sequencing program here. Um, next targeting cycle. And this is NGC uh, 1245 SD9. And we're going to say that's settled. Oh, this is a beautiful little part of the sky. Uh, let me switch you over to screen view. And then we're going to go to the title, and um, this is SD9 NGC 1245, an open cluster also in Perseus. C. Robin is a Gurnard. Now that's some New Zealand proprietary information there, Stu. Thanks for filling us in on that. What we're doing now is live, I'm sorry, uh, plate solving to make sure that we've got this cluster in the middle and also that'll help to create a better model for our mount. It's 0.19 degrees off just in that small slew that we did. And then what it's going to do here is start live stacking automatically just as soon as it feels like the scope is settled. Yeah, it. I, we're seeing these clouds. Take a look at these. Oh yeah, that's ugly, isn't it? Well, we knew these would come in, but we thought they'd come in at 10 p.m. That's what our, our software showed. But they have definitely made an early arrival, and we don't like it, do we? Nasty clouds. In fact, we're looking right through the clouds right here, maybe. Um, so we'll kind of adjust this live stack down here. We'll make a new black level right there on that crest, or just slightly to the left of it. And then we'll bring up the mids. Now, honestly, that cluster is right there in the middle. But it's actually not showing up very well in the live stack, but 
There, now it's starting to come in, isn't it? So you see right here is the cluster. That's a neat little arrangement of a, like a, um, a crown, huh? A princess crown. I'm sure Omira is going to tell us he's seeing something here. But not really liking this looks of this livestock much so far yet. Just kind of weird. I wonder if that's because of the, the effects of the clouds. Tell you what let's do. Let's take a chance here and let's Let's just go with, uh, let's stop the live stocking and just look at this cluster in real time. And we'll set this, we'll set the exposure on three seconds at gain of something like 250, something like that. And we'll just try looking at this in real time. Did you have any further issues with SIM 70 not connecting? No, Simon, it was, we replaced the cable and it worked fine. So uh, thanks for asking. Let's go up to gain. Um, Let's go ahead and go up to game 400 and um, boy. I wonder if we're staring at this part of the sky through some clouds. Look at, look at the sky. Yeah. We're staring right through those clouds there, which is a bummer, huh? Well, rats, you can see that it's peering through and finding these, this cluster, the middle of it right there. I guess we'll go back to live stacking, huh? Because we're definitely not seeing much here. Otherwise, and I had thought we would, the, now that's left over from the last, so let's clear that. I had thought we would get through, honestly, till maybe um, 10 p.m. I think, Eastern. 8.30 to 10 p.m. it was supposed to be clear. Here we go, this is a little better now. Pump these mids up. There we go. So this is SD... I'm sorry, SD9. The Patrick Starfish Cluster. Where did that name come from? William Herschel saw this one too, 1786. A beautiful, compressed, and rich cluster. Faint stars. Relatively small and dim, but rich. Um, tells where to find it. He says uh, it's about 27 light years across a billion years old, one of the senior members of all of our open clusters. He talks about the history of the people who found it and tells how to go find it. And then he says, it looks like a lily to him. <laughs> no spectacular double stars. It lies in the elegant richness at low power. Cannot escape seeing the starfish form of bright suns. Starfish. Sprinkled over with celestial sea salt. A granular texture composed of countless dim suns. Where does he get all these shapes? Um, for this reason, I call NG1245 the Patrick Starfish Cluster. It's a special imaginary creation for young Allison Nagler, the daughter of Teleview Optics president David Nagler, who's a fan of the animated kids TV show SpongeBob SquarePants. Patrick, a pink starfish, is SpongeBob's best friend. <laughs> Are we really naming our scientific clusters after SpongeBob characters? He sees that the cluster is falling apart. Well, Stu, see what else you got. It's a billion years old, has 200 members. It's in his Herschel 400 book. Okay. 
well, we're just going to like add an observation and we're going to take some of your data, Stu, because I refuse to write about SpongeBob. It's uh, one billion years old. And what did he say? Um, 200 members. Was it 1,700 light years distant? Was that correct? 1,700, 1,500 light years. Oh, below the plane of the galaxy. It's spread across 27 light years, and it's uh, 9,100 light years distant. 9,100 light years distant. Mike says, I love SpongeBob. <laughs> okay, Mike. Omira and Mike call this uh, Patrick, Patrick Starfish Cluster. Patrick Starfish Cluster. Lying at a distance of three kiloparsecs, this cluster is estimated to be 27 light years across. All right. So there you go, that's uh, SD9, NGC1245. So let's do a quick, a quick snapshot of this. And there's SD9. All right, so now we'll go up here and go to our next object sequence, we'll get into our, and the next object will do a refresh of our, of our observing list here, and we've got a planetary nebula at 11 degrees above the horizon. Let's see if we can catch it. It's NGC 1514. NGC 1514, and this is SD15. SD15. NGC 1514. It's a planetary nebula in Taurus. The mount has settled. Um, Patrick is cool, Mike says. Stu, I'm nearly 50 and I think sometimes SpongeBob is hilarious. Well, I need to watch it then. Uh, what we're going to do is go on this planetary nebula, we're going to say um, show chart. And there you see how low we are on the horizon, just between those two sets of trees, we hope, right? Hmm. Boy. Stellarium isn't uh, recognizing a planetary there. So tell you what, let's Let's try to find it in Stellarium because we're definitely not seeing it. So it's called uh, NGC 1514. There it is, NGC 1514. Do you think it's that? Do you think it's the Crystal Ball Nebula? It might be. Um, yeah, NGC 1514, it's called the Crystal Ball Nebula. Well, it doesn't look like our Rasa is lined up with it, does it? Let's go over here and check out the light. Oh, look at this. This is a mess. We're looking at, but look, there's the Planetary Nebula right in the middle. Uh, are you guys back on the screen? Yeah. So let's see if we can establish a new black level here that can peer through these clouds. And then zoom in a little. It's, it's that right there. So you can see the, um, on the close-up perhaps, you can see the material starting to kind of form around it and our live stacking here. So we'll let that livestock for a second. Look at this ejected material over here. I hope you can see that. This is NGC 1514, Stu. What you got on this? NGC 
NGC 1514. Larry, I'm curious if you've had your um, scope out lately, if it's been good enough weather. This is num SD Secret. This is Secret Deep 15. And Herschel discovered this. A mostly singular phenomenon, he said. Herschel wrote, it's a star of eight magnitude with a faint luminous atmosphere of a circular form. So he was like describing the planetary without knowing what it was. He says it's about three arc minutes in diameter. The star is perfectly in the center and the atmosphere is so diluted, faint and equal throughout that there can be no surmise of its consisting of stars, nor can there be a doubt of the evident connection between the atmosphere and the star. Another star, not much less in brightness in the same field, it's perfectly free of any such appearance. So Herschel was describing a planetary even though he didn't know what one was yet. It's a visually troublesome object. It's difficult even for an 8-inch telescope. Hmm, he wasn't able to do it in his 5-inch. No, oh, he did. Finally, bring it in with a little, a little higher uh, power. He tells about the history. This nebulous matter was not resolved. So Herschel reasoned it was just nebulosity. And then Huggins found the first clue to the true nature of planetary nebulae in the spectrum of NGC 6543 that it was a luminous gas, not that of a haze of unresolved suns. Stu says, I'm gazing in wonder at the La Palma Observatory picture of it. Wow. Up until this object, he thought planetary nebulae were stars too faint to resolve, forced him to rethink his ideas. Good, Stu. So we're seeing a bit of history here. This is part of what Herschel saw in, what, 1790? That's a long time ago. It's enigmatic. Talks about what a weird bunch of ejected material it has. Has a couple of different shells. I wonder how much cloud we could very yeah, look at that. We could very well be trying to peer at it right through that cloud. Bummer. But at least it's starting to form up. Let's play with our play with our block level here and let's just barely get rid of the cloud. So what we're doing is we're, we're establishing with SharpCap, which is our imaging program here, we're saying we'd like for you to redefine what is black. Okay, so if we make that the new black and then dial up the mids just enough to not see the clouds. Now we're starting to see some detail. So look how there seems to be a polarity in this ejected material. There is an open channel here and an open channel there. And look at this little, a little stub there sticking out. Now I'm curious what we'll find when we go to the uh, La Palma observatory picture of it. Let's go to NGC 15, NGC 1514, La Palma, and see what we can find. Oh, it is beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. So now you can see that that stub that we're seeing is this cloud, this star. And look how we were making out this hollowed out area here. So we're at six minutes. Um, I'm interested in this idea that Omira says it has two different shells. That's why he says it's enigmatic, huh? You guys have studied, I'm sure, um, planetary nebulae before. 
The bright visible component is a giant star with stellar classification A03, while the nebula generating companion is now a hot subluminous O type star. A well defined circular form out to at least two arc minutes. Two prominent arcs of light along the outer edge. Perpendicular to these arcs are fainter elliptical glows. These features are surrounded by a circular collar of dim light. That is a beautiful picture, I think, uh, Stu, thanks for pointing that out to us. Okay, so we can see these lobes, and then there's that little star. And all of this was through a little bit of cloud, so we're going to say add observation, and we're going to say we could make out the two opposing lobes prior to checking out the beautiful La Palma image that Stu found. Um, it's crazy to think that we're looking at an object that Herschel discovered in 1790, prompting some of the first descriptions of planetary nebulae. Huh. A little bit of history. Ricky, good to have you here from Florida. Welcome. All right, so that's uh, NGC 1514. We'll go ahead and snap a picture exactly as seen. That is amazing. And we were down pretty low. we got to remember, uh, we were looking through about three atmospheres since it was just at 11 degrees. Uh, this will be a lot better, I bet, when we catch it higher someday. Let's run this refresh again. And, boy, there's a galaxy at five degrees. Let's just go see if we can catch that just for fun. How low can we get to the horizon and still see a galaxy? Next target cycle at five degrees. Slew to it. Can we see something at five degrees above the horizon? It's NGC 1084. NGC 1084. We're just trying to kind of try out our scope and our observatory. Yeah, Stu says it's always better to see these higher. All this is, do we're trying to, like, test the observatory. Can we actually see something that low? That's what we're asking. And uh, the title, we hope, is Secret Deep 8. Secret Deep 8, NGC 1084. And this is a galaxy in... Eridana, Arid, Eridani, Arid, Arab, Secret Deep Eight, Eridanus. Is that what it is? An N in the U.S. Eridanus. Boy, he doesn't say the. Oh, there it is. Eridanus. Yeah, Eridanus. Eridanus. No, I don't think we're, I think we're into the, boy, we're very close to it. Look, there's a star. Not enough stars there to livestock. So let's look at our sky cam. Yeah, we're looking across over there at that tree. <laughs> Let me go and look at that sky cam view a little closer. You know what else hurts us is the cloudiness. Look, the parking lot lights are still on. I forgot to turn off the parking lot lights, apparently. That's crazy. I think we're seeing one of these trees maybe right here. Let's do this. Let's look at our, just for fun, let's look at our... Um, 
we're gonna say show chart. Well, it says it's above the horizon in our in our horizon here. It should be above the horizon. Boy, how is that a galaxy? That must be some kind of irregular galaxy. I cannot imagine it's going to be able to live stack that. Just not enough stars, huh? Out with the chainsaw, Stu says. <laughs> Ricky says, I'll lose signal in just a bit. Going in the middle of the Everglades to capture a couple of DSOs. That's awesome, Ricky. Watch the gators. Yeah, no solution found. So let's remember that five degrees is pressing matters a little. Uh, and let's skip to the next one. This is at 42 degrees, and it's an open cluster in Cassiopeia. It's SD6. So let's close this down. Stop. Stop. And say next target cycle. And this will be at 42 degrees. So let's slew to that. It's... B-O-C-L-122. Did anybody ever hear of B-O-C-L before the catalog? 122. I've never heard of such a thing. Um, SD-6. B-O-C-L. 122, an open cluster in Cassi Cassiopeia. Lots better height than this. Ricky, got a picture of a gator that hangs out next to my spot. My wife won't let me bring him home, though. Well, imagine that. Where's her sense of adventure, Ricky? Okay, so this is SD6. Bring out the chainsaw, Stu says. <laughs> SD6. And the, the nickname is something like Nine Stitch Punks. Wow, look at that cluster though, gang. Is that nice or what? Wow. I can't tell if that's just the sky or if that's the cluster. Now we're, we're, um, Collecting the first 20 second exposure in the live stacking mode. Um, you know, I've talked about live stacking before. It really is amazing. Not only does it help you bring in faint objects, but it also helps you Boy, look at those clouds. It also helps you um, average out the light pollution when you have light pollution. So a couple of ways it helps. I wonder if this is, this is the cluster here or is that the cluster here? And look, it might be surrounded by this lane of dark material. Wouldn't that be interesting if it were like this rectangular shape here? Let's see if we can use deep sky image annotation. No deep sky catalogs in view. Ten objects are just out of view. So it does not have, this is such an obscure, an obscure NGC object that the astrometry that SharpCap is using but look, I bet you anything, it's this cluster here in the middle. And it's surrounded, I bet, by these dark lanes of something. 
Okay, let's read and find out. SD6. It's called STOCK2, S-T-O-C-K, STOCK2. It's a surprisingly bright and large open cluster about two degrees northwest of the Great Double Cluster. Uh, it's in a stellar tapestry of the winter Milky Way. It's just as bright as the double cluster. It lacks a strong central condensation. Makes it less obvious seeing two concentrated flashlight beams against a distant background versus that of a single diffuse beam. Indeed, the irregularly bright suns of stock two are coarsely scattered across two moon diameters of sky in a rich band of Milky Way, causing it to almost blend with the background. Yep. Yet once detected, stock two springs to life becoming quite obvious, especially binoculars and wide-field telescopes, which is what we have, a wide-field telescope. What's visually intriguing is that while the double cluster lies at 7,300 light-years away, uh, stock 2 is a foreground object 1,100 light-years distant, lying almost in front of the double cluster in the Orion spiral arm. And he says... A little bit about the history of who discovered it. Some descriptions people give of it. It's long been classified as a young cluster with an age ranging anywhere from 100 million to 170 million years. Um, but Salvatore Ciortino from the ROSAT satellite data uh, has said that he thinks it's somewhere between 700 million years and 100 million years. So it just shows that we really don't know how old these things are sometimes. Determining the lithium abundance of its members may help to refine the cluster's age. Lithium, the third element of the periodic table, tells how you can use lithium to age something. Tells how to find it. And then he sketches it here. Um, it's a one degree wide scintillating flurry of regularly bright suns. I wonder if it's wider than what we're seeing here. 80 irregularly bright members Let's try to see if we can get a little more. I see a, a, a mad pixel, which reminds me to go up and in the pre-processing, pre select the right dark, which should be Twenty seconds. Gain one hundred. Here we go. So next time we'll hopefully get rid of those pixels. You know it's probably wider than what we're giving it credit for. He's probably seeing it as this big thing here. There's so much background, so many background stars. It's hard to know, but look how they're irregularly bright right there in the middle. See how it's irregularly bright. He says, I don't recognize a cluster core, though the two tiny Y-shaped strings of stars each just a few arc minutes long can be found here. So see, there might be one of those Y shapes. Here might be another Y shape. A stick figure with arms up next to its head flexing, hence Muscle Man Cluster name. How do you, how do you know? Okay, I tell you what, this could be a stick figure arm, and that could be a stick figure arm. I like that much better, Stu. Okay, we're gonna go with that. Oh, 
the stuff in O'Meara's book. I didn't understand much of that, but Stu instantly says, this is the muscle man cluster because of the two, because of the fact that it looks like a stick figure with arms up to its head flexing. So this is an arm and that's a flex and this is another arm and that's another flex. I got it! So many background stars. It's easy to lose this cluster. So there you go. That's uh, BOCL122, otherwise known as Stock 2. So maybe I'll just do a quick screen grab. And call the screen grab. Stock two Bo B O C L one twenty two, whatever that is. Um, this is uh, eight minutes and um, twenty four frames on twenty twenty two ten uh, twenty seven. Boy, can you believe we're almost at the end of October? Boy, there, there's just a lot of clouds we're looking through, guys. <laughs> All right, we're going to call it. Uh, now we'll do another refresh here. And uh, let's do a galaxy. Let's do NGC 488. It's Secret Deep 3. Secret Deep 3. SD3. NGC 488. NGC 488. And this is... SD three NGC four eighty eight a galaxy and Pisces. Okay, let's look at the sky for a second. Hmm. Just kind of a faint wispiness. The clarity is not great. There's just a, a general faint wispiness that has kind of descended on Louisville, Kentucky. This was not supposed to move in until 10, and it's 45 minutes early. Anyway, we don't have the moon tonight, so we can be grateful for that, right? Um, this is SD3. Let's read about this. SD3. It's the Whirligig galaxy. It's a spiral. Herschel found it in 1784. Boy, this guy. Could he not find galaxies or what? I mean, it's irregularly round. Very faint. Pretty large. Now, Omira says, NGC 488 is a small but beautiful spiral. Oh, right there it is. In the middle, it's already showing up even though the scope isn't settled yet. 
Now the scope is settled and you can begin to see that faint little patch right in the middle. Let's hope through this wispy cloudiness we can bring this in. It's um, Hmm, a fine weave of spiral arms dappled with extragalactic filigree. What is extragalactic filigree? Um, he moved to Hawaii and he loved it once he got there. It's 46 degrees from face on. Stu, yeah, same thing. Face on, so it looks like a perfect disc. Tightly wound spiral pattern reminds me of a 4th of July whirly gig, surrounded by bursts of foreground starlight and little extra galactic sparklers. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can start trying to bring this in. You can see where the white balance ended up all the way over here this time. There goes a photobombing satellite. And now we'll bring our mids over a little bit till we start illuminating the clouds. So we're already seeing this at just 80 seconds. You know, this is to me the miracle of EAA that in 80 seconds we can start seeing this with live stocking. Another thing that does help though is our ROS 11 does operate at f2, which is a, an amazingly wide open aperture, isn't it? But look at the way this open cluster is starting to show up. You know, this past week I was thinking, where would EAA practitioners, electronically assisted astronomy practitioners, where would we start to talk about, you know, our craft? And I know there are some on cloudy nights, but you'll recall they kicked me off because they considered me advocating for too many things. I would advocate for a, a meeting somewhere. I would advocate for a website or whatever. They called me a vendor for a while, and they finally just said, you know, you're too noisy, and they shut me off. They kicked me out of cloudy nights. So if you're on cloudy nights, be very still. <laughs> um, so I tried to think of where we could invite rejects like Doug, and I thought, have you guys ever heard of a, a site called Reddit? And it tends to attract, um, I think more than anything else, maybe younger people and um, maybe um, researchers and people that are studying things, maybe, I don't know, uh, university professors and such. So I went there and sure enough, uh, they let me start a, um, a, a thing called EAA Astronomy. EAA Astronomy. And the R, I think that stands for Reddit, so R slash EAA Astronomy. And the link I'll have to put in the description of this video is just Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T, Reddit. I bet if you go to Google and search Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T, EAA Astronomy. Let's try it. Let's just try it. Reddit EAA Astronomy and see if it finds it. Mm, not so much. How about if we connect EAA Astronomy with that underline? No. We must not be famous enough there. Not enough people have joined it. So you're going to have to go to reddit.com slash r slash eaa underscore astronomy and I'll put the um, I'll put the, the the URL in the description of this video but I would love it if you guys could stop by and maybe some of you would want to join we have three members already member Pete from over in um, Oh, Stu says you'll love Reddit. Yay, Stu. Stu says there are 3,500 active Starlink satellites. Oh, my goodness. That's nightmarish. Filigree whirligigs. Um, 
if you guys wouldn't mind, just go there and, and man, if you're willing to become a member, just join, you know. You don't have to download the app. You can look at it on the web if you want without downloading an app. But it would be great to have you there. And I'm trying to like put a new post once a day. That's what I'll try to do. A new post once a day. And it would be grand if you could try it. Okay, back to our object. This is again NGC 488. Boy, there's so much cloud wisp that we have to, to blot out those clouds. We're basically taking out part of the wispiness of the galaxy. But we are starting at just five minutes. We're starting to see that it is a disk. And we can now make out the center core the blob in the middle. But boy, we cannot see any defined arms yet. Can we? I don't think so. Maybe just barely. I'll tell you what, let's go look at this in some kind of Hubble view or something. NGC 488 wiki. Wow, is that a real picture or is that made up? You're kidding. That is so beautiful, isn't it? I wonder who this is. If this is Hubble? Um, 32 inch Schulman RC Optical Systems Telescope. It's on Mount Lemmon. Stu, you've talked about this before. <laughs> Look at that, you've already written about it. The arms aren't very defined, they're tightly wound. Stu says, try our telescopes. There's a group of EAA enthusiasts there. I did. I looked that they are in there, but they didn't have an EAA specific forum. Yeah, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Well, I think we would have to image for a few more minutes to get this. We can definitely see that we're starting to see the, the disc shape of it, but boy, to, to see the windings, that's a stretch for us, isn't it? So let's add observation here. We're at seven minutes right now. And let's say we could definitely see the disc, but the Mount Lemon photo is gorgeous. The uh, spirals are so tightly wound, we couldn't see much in the way of dust trails between them. We could see the beginnings of a lot of, uh, what would you call it, like cast off flurry around the disk and we could make out the central bulge, the core. Going to have to poach some members from them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Poach some members from the telescope group. It's a good idea, Stu. I'm not above it. Okay, so this is the end of NGC 488. We're going to save this as seen. We're going to keep on trying to eke out the last half an hour. Uh, why don't we go to another one of these BOCLs. Boy, I guess OCL stands for Open Cluster, right? Can somebody look up for us? What is BOCL target? What is BOCL um catalog stand for. BO sounds like, well, I just won't say what that sounds like. Um, let's head to that object. It's SD5, BOCL 101. SD5. The Loch Ness Monster Cluster, the Queen's Reflection, otherwise known as 
Colander 463. Colander discovered this in 1931. Maybe. It's forgotten in the high northern reaches of Cassiopeia. He thinks of it as the queen's reflection. This is BOCL 101. SD5. Oh yeah, I think we're going to be able to see this. He says, um, it's easier to see the queen of Ethiopia sitting in her chair or throne. If you envision the chair as depicted on page 36, One guy called it a dipper of stars. The Queen's Reflection. And then he talks about the history of people observing it. It's large and loose spans 38 light years relatively young, 150 million years old This one is 220 light years closer than M35. He compares it to other NGC objects. It's hard to see in the naked eye, but it can be done, he says. It's an eye grabber and rich field telescopes, which are best for showing such a large celestial treasure. He says, uh, the cluster's central 30 arc minutes are seen with South Up, they remind him of a plesiosaurus, the large marine dinosaur that swam in the Jurassic Seas. Or better yet, how about Nessie, Scotland's legendary Loch Ness monster? What? Has a active triangle of suns in the north that forms the dinosaur's head. No idea. Um, Lines of stars extending to the northwest and southwest that looks like the beast's flippers and a wagging tail that reaches to the east. It's a virtual celestial Rorschach test. Just turn your head, all manner of forms can be created. What do you guys make of this? Uh, surprisingly rich, 80 stars. It's always accessible. Well, what do you guys think? Is this a flipper? And is that a flipper? No idea. Where does the cluster start and where does it end? not charted in deep sky image annotation. These are exotic galaxies, exotic clusters. I guess it's where this fine, these little strings of stars are. See that little, little path or sequence of stars? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, sorry guys, <laughs> sorry. I, I commit not to do that anymore, and then I do it again. I just, uh, I can't tell where these cluster, where this cluster is. Hmm. You know, this could be the head of the Loch Ness Monster. And then this could be the body So there's the head, there's the body, there's a fin. Now we're kind of following this dark matter trail here. 
Do you guys see it? I think this is the head. Now it's the body. And here's the dark matter body. And this is a fin on top. And then here are flippers. Shoo! Use your imagination on that one. BOCL 101. This is another rich star field. Took a while to visualize the triangle head. It's uh, 2280 light years away. Herschel didn't catch it. Colander 463. Yeah, it's up there. Colander 463. Pretty fascinating. I didn't change this title down here, sorry. NGC 5, or I'm sorry, SD5 NGC, no, Colander. Four sixty three. A cluster in Cassiopeia. So there you have it. I think it's kind of pretty once you start picking it out, right? Oh, Mira, we would never, ever have come to see these objects, gang, if this guy hadn't written a book about them. Um, let's go see this planetary nebula, NGC 6781. NGC 6781. NGC 6781. SD 90. A planet. Terry Nebula in Aquila. Still lots of wispy clouds. They just give, you know, just make for poor seeing. There goes the trail of starlings. Anyway, this is going to be our planetary, we think, once we find it. This is uh, SD90. It's the ghost of the moon. You know, it appears there's only one L in Aquila. One L. Need to learn that. It was Herschel who discovered it. He called it considerably faint, irregularly round, three or four arc minutes in diameter. He didn't know what to call it. Oh my goodness, right there it is. NGC 6781. We saw this faint planetary nebula even before live stacking commenced. It's faint but 
large. Hmm. It's called the ghost of the moon. Okay, let's pull our blacks over until that sky. Look at all those stars, my goodness. Is that not amazing or what? Hey, this is a nice planetary nebula, gang. Take a look, we're already seeing reds. At 80 seconds, we're already seeing the reds, which would be your hydrogens. The bipolar dust shell of this nebula is believed to be barrel-shaped and is being viewed from nearly pole on. Boy, I'm loving it. Scott Gridley. Welcome, Scott. Scott says, that's super. By the way, if you guys do like content like this and you'd like to subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything, but it does help the channel to get in other people's uh, searches. So if it wouldn't uh, trouble you too much, if you would want to subscribe, and only if you like content like this, if you could click a thumbs up. Obviously, if you don't like content like this, no pressure. <laughs> but if you do, click a thumbs up. And if you want to be notified before we do these live streams, just go to emeraldhillskies.com and there's an email address you can send an email address. You can send an email to that email address from the email by which you want to be notified. And anywhere from 48 hours to 24 hours, sometimes same day, we'll uh, send an email to confirm this. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, of course, you'll also get the YouTube announcement that the uh, live stream is about to happen. Uh, th that starts coming even two days before, you know, so. Boy, look how bright that hydrogen gas is. Whew, that's amazing. Almost looks like an apple that has been cored in the top. It's just so luminous, isn't it? It looks a lot like a piece of fruit. Wow. Bipolar. Huh, must have trouble sitting still in class or something. It's tilted only about 25 degrees. Stu says, if you click the bell icon to enable mo notifications, then you'll see the notification. Good point, Stu. Thanks. Fast, low-density gas is flowing through the torus and expanding perpendicularly with a velocity proportional to the distance to the central star. So he talks about ejecting these clouds of gas near the ends of its life which trudge outward from the star into the interstellar medium. The loss of the outer layers of the star into space exposes the hot stellar core whose strong and fast ionizing winds can interact with these more slowly moving, previously ejected shells, causing them to fluoresce as a planetary nebula. Tells how to find it. Says it has a Fantastic shell. It appears a ghost image of the naked eye moon. That's fun. Boy, it's definitely one of the planetary nebulae that have the most character, isn't it?
I would really think that some people would want to call it the Apple Core Nebula. Ricky, be careful. Watch out for the Crocs. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks for listening. All right. Let's, um, let's save a copy of this because that's definitely beautiful and worth saving. Look at all the detail in the outer shell that we're starting to see. It's beautiful. I don't know at what point we start picking up these wispy clouds. Definitely there. <laughs> Fascinating. NGC 6781. All right, we're in our last 19 minutes, let's hope the wispy clouds will stay wispy. And um, let's do a refresh of this run and how about, do you guys want to do another planetary nebula? Well, here's a diffuse nebula, SD-103. Let's go there. SD-103. SD-103. It's NGC-7129. NGC-7129. SD-103, NGC-7129, a diffuse nebula in Cepheus. Something like that. You know, um, over the, the past week, I did a little um, one-hour Emerald Hill Sky Skylet about Stellarium. And I honestly would like to start working Stellarium more into the workflow so we can see where things are before we kind of settle in there. Show chart. Let's back out. Because I think it is helpful. So now we're viewing north. Here's the north celestial pole. So we're just, what, five degrees west of the meridian. Five degrees west of the meridian or whatever. And it sort of lies underneath this band of the Milky Way. Stu says it's called the Cosmic Rose. Boy, it is beautiful, isn't it? The Small Cluster Nebula, SD-103. Cosmic Rose Bud, Omira calls it. Herschel discovered it. Don't you want to grow up to be like Herschel? Wow. Look at all this nebulosity. This reminds us of the Pleiades. And then look here at this red hydrogen. This blue must be uh, kind of, what, oxygen and soot. Just, just carbon, maybe. Let's go have a look. Wow. We're not seeing much unless, look at that shape. That looks sort of like a dipper handle, doesn't it? And this looks like a dipper handle here. Let's pull our blacks over to here. Yep, sure enough. 
Wow, look at this cluster here. Let's look at a deep sky image annotation here. Surely it'll show some of this. Yeah, that's NGC 142 there. And it does identify this nebula as well. It identifies it as IC5134, which must be another name of NGC 7129. Okay, let's go back to the live view. Oh, that is a live view. I'm <laughs> sorry. I was thinking that was so nice that that must be um, Stellarium, but it's not. It's the live view. Can we get rid of some of that? Looks like we have a lot of wispy clouds, doesn't it? But when you get rid of too many of the clouds, it starts getting rid of the nebula. NGC 7129 is located just half a degree from nearby NGC 7142. I see. Oh, so here's 7142. And here you're saying is 7129. Now in the deep sky image annotation in SharpCap, this deep sky image annotation doesn't recognize it as in NGC 7129, sadly. But at least it's showing you this nice open cluster here. Looking at all that cloudiness, wow. Wow, that's beautiful. And this is uh, 103. It's a pretty little reflection nebula, heart of the celestial king Cephi, an astrophysical wonder and a participant in an, in an historical mystery. William Herschel discovered the nebula in 1794, cataloging it as a planetary because of its round form. Yeah, you can see in his 18-inch homemade telescope from back in 1790 why it might have looked like that. Um, he said it, it involved three roughly ninth magnitude stars. He said it was a very coarse triple star involved in a nebulous atmosphere, a curious object. The nebula is extremely faint and graduates away. The three bright stars huddled the nebula's core would not have been surprising to Williams since he believed that all diffuse nebulae would collect into smaller concentrated clouds. He talks about all the history and the measurements. He points out that 7133 was to the northeast of 7129. Talks about the ninth magnitude cluster 7142. Mm -hmm. Talks about the nebulosity. He thinks that. Um, Herschel mistook 7129 for a new nebula. This could be a, a part of the open cluster 7129. And if so, 7133 just really doesn't exist. 
7129 is a nebula and cluster whose position is listed in the table above, plotted correctly in the chart. Molecular cloud skirts the upper regions of the Cepheus bubble. Says they're examining the spectra and still discovering things about it. Tells how to find it. He talks about finding it in his five inch refractor and he describes the different knots. The easternmost knot is the brightest and has structure. The western knot is amorphous with just a round glow. have to reminds you of the uh, nebulosity around M45 doesn't it the Pleiades nebulosity let's do a save I guess a little bit more brightness than that boy it doesn't take much before it begins to just capture the entire atmosphere Check out the infrared image from Spitzer. Spitzer, and this is NGC 7129. NGC 7129. Spitzer image. Oh, wow. That is killer, isn't it? Wow. Is that the one you mean, I bet? Stu, you're starting to pick up the dark nebula at the top right, maybe. Wow, that would be great if we are. Oh, and look. Yeah, and there's some of that red starting to come through. That's at eight minutes. Let's go back in uh, Stellarium. So we're starting to pick up maybe this is that right see there's the handle and the ladle here's the handle yeah we're starting to pick up this red You're right, we're starting to see all those darker colors now. Boy, getting rid of these clouds would be really nice. Yeah, look at those clouds right in the middle. Right in the middle of it. Hmm, look at that. Not sure where to set these livestock lines so that we get the best for our money's worth, you know? This is a difficult object, especially in the wispiness of the clouds, right? Let's set our black line here and then move the mids over here and see what happens. More brightness. How about if we move them over here? That's strange. Completely different way of handling the livestock when you're in the middle of clouds. But look how that's showing us a different view of the nebulosity. And all those interior stars. 
Strange, isn't it? I don't want to observe with clouds. Wow, yeah, look at those stars come through when we do it like that. It's the clouds, Stu says. Very much like a rosebud, Stu says. Well, we hoped that we'd be able to get by until 10 p.m., which is four minutes away. Sure enough, uh, we just got general patterns of wispy clouds plaguing us. Notice they're not really covering up the whole sky. They're just wispy. And that's why our, our uh, clear, what's it called, clear sky, is that what it's called? Clear sky, clear outside. This is the app we use for predicting clarity. And it said that, as you can see, the, the clouds were supposed to come at somewhere around 10 or 11. But they just rolled in little by little instead of coming in at 10 or 11, sadly. Nevertheless, we did get quite a few objects uh, you know, we, did, we were able to observe quite a few objects, including this strange little one here. I think we're going to go ahead and call it a night. And thank you guys for being here. This was the only night this week that, that we could observe, not only because of the clouds, but because of travel. But we'll be back and catch the first clear night next week, whether that's I don't know, maybe Monday night, perhaps. We'll see what Monday night does, and we'll let you know in the YouTube subscription and also the Emerald Hill Skies um, email list. And don't forget, there is a Patreon channel. Who knows if I remember what it's called. Oh, I think it's just Patreon patreon.com slash emerald hill skies so there is that patreon.com slash emerald hill skies and please if you get a chance try out this new eaa underscore astronomy eaa underscore astronomy at uh, reddit r-e-d-d-i-t it'd be great to have you join there and uh, kind of join in the conversation i'll pledge to try to do well we've got two new members right there so must have been two of you guys that joined. Scott says, I appreciate this live stream tonight as I was planning on getting NGC 7331 tonight with my own EA rig, but I over tightened on a cable management project, so this is a good bit of enjoyment. Scott, you're very kind. Mike, you're very kind, saying it was worth it. Yes, Mike, you're one of those folks that joined the Reddit channel. Really, if we have the five of us, I'm happy now. It, just, it was lonely for a while, but now you guys are there. Pete is there from the Isle of Wight over off the coast of England. And uh, we'll just start sharing what we can. You guys post what you like to as well. It's an open forum. And there's an interesting post about, let's develop a model for image quality with EAA. And I hope you'll check that out before it's over. Uh, the model is a notional equation that I hope you'll check out. They're on that Reddit. Uh, you don't call it a channel, do you? It's a Reddit space. Anyway. God bless you guys. Thanks a lot for being a part of this tonight. We will look forward to seeing you next time. Don't forget to subscribe and click thumbs up and the little bell if you want to be notified. Take care and uh, thanks to God for making these cool objects and for letting us see through the clouds, even though it was a bit wispy cloudy night. God bless. Have a good evening and we'll talk.